Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Jacqueline, I'd, I'd love to start here. Um, you've said in a number of conversations I've listened to that when you were six years old, you knew you wanted to make a difference in the world. Was there anything magic about like six? Did something happen? Or was it, is that just a metaphor from, hey, from the time I was little, I know I could make do something meaningful with my life or wanted to do that. Thanks, Karen. It's great to be here. Um, I would say that someone happened. Um, my father was in Vietnam. Um, I was in a Catholic school with an 80-year-old nun named S- Sister Mary Theophane, and I, I just adored her. Um, mm. And for whatever reason, she took me under her wing. Um, and I would walk every morning at 6 a.m. to go help her clean the sacristy. And, um, and she would almost, almost as if in daily prayer, say, to whom much is given, much is expected and imprinted me, um, quite deeply. Uh, at the time, also on the, on the wall of that first grade classroom was one of the, you have to be our age, but, a begging bowl held by two hands. Um, And we would always have to think about the poor children in Asia that didn't have enough to eat while Mm -hmm. my father was in Vietnam. And so I think the combination of missing him, knowing he was on the other side of the world, and this gorgeous elderly nun um, made me decide I wanted to do something for the world and for other people. Wow. Okay. So that was a very positive encounter with a nun. Did you mind if I double click on that? Because as you know, we have a number of faith leaders listening. I got, I got very interested as a teenager in Jesuit spirituality, even though I come from a Protestant tradition. And there was something about the devotedness. There was something about the different rhythm, about the offices, the order that I found very interesting, and yet so many people struggle with that. Do you know in particular, like, can you drill down a little bit more on what you saw, the good side of the church? Because mostly in the in the paper these days, all we read about is the bad side. And there's a lot of bad, but there's also some good. What, what was so compelling? I actually think a lot of things were compelling for me as a little girl. Um, a sense of community, um, there was this adult who in some ways saw me as part of her world and made me feel incredibly special. It was a time in history too, right? Where so much was changing. And as a little yeah. girl who had this fierceness inside of me, um, and a competitiveness, if we would get a hundred on our exams, I mean, I was six. So to put that in perspective, <laughs> or we had perfect handwriting, um, we right. could either get stars on our foreheads or she would give us saints cards, like baseball cards, except they had saints with stories of the saints on the other side. And No way. Oh, yeah. And I knew those saints. I collected those saints cards. I took them very seriously. And, um, and it was literally only a few years ago when I was talking to the poet Marie Howe, who also comes from a, an enormous Catholic family, and we were laughing about the saints cards because I kind of wanted to be a saint. Um, And she said, well, you know, Jacqueline, don't laugh because those stories of the saints were the first stories we as little girls may have read about women who wrote the narratives of their own lives. Hmm. And when you think about it, um, Nelson Mandela, before he was put into jail for 26 years, talked about fighting for human equality and said it is an ideal for which I am live which I am prepared to live and if I if necessary I am prepared to die. And um 
And so were those saints. And so um, I think in a way they were the precursors to social entrepreneurs, to a lot of heroes of mine who stood for something bigger than themselves and were ready to pay a price. That's amazing that they can capture the heart of a six-year-old. Well, I don't, I wouldn't have been able to articulate it in those ways, except that I can still tell you the stories of St. Elizabeth and St. Julia and particularly the ones that ended up boiling and, you know, vats of oil. But it was more than that. It was taking food from their wealthy families and hiding it under their cloak um, to give it to the poor um, and then getting caught by their wealthy families um, in the case of St. Elizabeth and um, actually by her husband. And when it was a snowy day and he opened up her cloak to show that she was hiding all this bread and sausage and out fell roses in this great story um, that captures the imagination of a six-year-old and at least mine. And, um, and I've always loved literature. I've always loved those stories of what could be. So hmm. I didn't have the language, uh, and I'm grateful for Marie Howe for making a connection, but I was definitely obsessed with the stories. Hmm. So you had that from a very early age. Also, um, you, I've heard you say, and you seem to be a person who likes to stand up for truth. It's like, I gotta, I gotta say the truth here. I cannot tell a lie. Uh, you had a, an experience in high school. I've heard you sh- share the story in trigonometry class and uh, a few other situations in banking where you, you had this, this, this quest for truth. Can you talk about that? Because I am interested in what shaped your work. We're going to talk about acumen. We're going to talk about um, changing the world literally and impact investing and all of that. But it is, it is a trail of breadcrumbs to get to where you are today. Mm. Yeah. And again, I, I, there was the, the rule, I will not tell a lie, but I think Carrie, in some ways I was, I was, yes, I was a truth teller, but I think I was a protector. I think I was almost raised to be a protector and maybe like so many little kids um, that are given a lot of responsibility at an early age, when you're the eldest of seven and your dad's overseas, um, just by definition, you have responsibility. And, and it may have been more connected to that. I'm not quite sure. But um, on this particular day in trigonometry test, in, in trigonometry class, we'd been given a pop quiz And my uh, teacher had promised me at the math team practice the night before, where I was captain of the math team, that uh, if we had a full practice, we wouldn't have a quiz the next day. And I said, do you promise? And he said, yes. And so that when he violated that promise and gave us the test, I knew my friend, who I had assured could go to class even though she'd been sick for the previous few days because we weren't having a test. I knew that she was not only going to fail, but that she would hold me to account. And um, and so it was that urge to say, no, I will not let her suffer for something I said based on what you promised me. And um, <laughs> and it was really just a, a, a gut reaction. And it's funny when I talked about that on Tim Ferriss's story, show. It was literally the first time in like 40 years since I'd even thought of that story. A couple of friends from that high school class wrote to me and said, I remember that day. So I <laughs> clearly, uh, I guess made an impression. I did get kicked out of the class, unfortunately, but uh, felt like a fair price. I would have loved to have been kicked out of trigonometry. So <laughs> that's it. good for you. It was a little You're... harder, Gary. <laughs> yeah, it did. I, I, I never quite went there. <laughs> um, what were some other, like you mentioned your father a few times, what were some other very formative experiences for you as a child or teenager? Oh, um, so many. The one that just instantly pops to mind, um, my senior year in high school, we had, we had moved, um, constantly actually my whole life, dad in the military, um, and when, whenever you went to Vietnam, you could choose where you would live. And so my parents kept moving, 
um, probably more than many military families. And, um, uh, but my senior in high school was a year, 1979, when seatbelts were still not required. There was a lot of drunk driving. And, um, and there were a number of car crashes that year with friends of mine that, who were killed. Uh, also one of my best friends, uh, died of Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then, um, three kids in the class on New Year's Eve, um, burned down the high school. So we had to go to another high school. And in oh that goodness. year, I, like so many of the kids in my class, really went into, um, deep, deep soul searching. What is life about? How can it be so short? And, and part of my lens, I would say, was, um, focused on why such horrible things happen to such good people. And why did the guy that was the leader in burning down the school plea bargain and not have to go to jail when the other two guys who were the followers uh, did go to jail? And so I'd say for a kid who grew up um, surrounded by family and the sense that the world was good and right, and I had uh, characters like Sister Maria Theophan around me, um, that feeling that life was also deeply unfair had a huge impact on me. Um, and that has come back throughout my life, um, that recognition that really bad things happen to really good people, that you can do everything right and still have horrible things happen to you. And that mm -hmm. finding that sense of resilience and strength and um, and faith, whether you're a believer or a non-believer, that the world can get better and you can help make it so, I think is has been a, a theme, a thread of my life. It's a really young age to process all of that, particularly, you know, we're... we're um, similar ages, I would imagine. And, you know, you didn't have the onslaught of social media that you have today where you kind of know what's going on in the world, right? You, you know, you can't really escape it. And we have a lot of young leaders listening who I know want to make an impact with your, with their life. So you're 18, 19 years old processing all these things and you end up in one of the most changed the world industries ever banking investment banking, <laughs> like that's not a very likely career path to go and change the world. It seems to be part of the establishment, but that was really formative in your experience. Am I, am I correct? Can you talk about that, that season that brought you into eventually Acumen? Like so many immigrant kids today, um, being in an immigrant military family, um, my father and mother had really pushed me um, to go through the interview process in school because I had intended to take a year off having worked so much uh, to pay my way through university. And so I ended up accidentally, if you will, as a banker. But I, I was excited for the job because I had had this yearning since I was six as well to know the world. Um, I wanted to know those kids in Vietnam. I wanted to understand other cultures and other people. And, um, and I was interested in the political and economic worlds of other mm -hmm. nations, if not the financial, um, systems. But what Chase did was number one, get me to 40 countries where I did not only under begin to understand the financial uh, situations, the economies, the, the confluence of economics and politics. Um, but it gave me a whole new language, a whole lexicon based on knowing how to read spreadsheets and, 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 and financials and understanding that the way we spend our money is connected to what we value and what we build. <laughs> and so I felt deeply and continue to feel deeply grateful. Uh, for that as the first real professional experience of my life. Um, what I didn't love 
was this recognition, particularly uh, when working in places like Brazil and Chile, um, when I saw that the poor were excluded from the banks, um, most low-income people neither had the confidence nor were welcome to walk into the doors of the bank and therefore weren't part of the economic system, not in any formal way. And that was when I decided I had to leave banking, but equipped with a whole new set of tools. Hmm. Yeah. So why did you choose, what, if, if I've got this wrong, you tell me, but impact investing, this whole idea of like you kind of almost pioneered a category. Well, like so many things in my life, Carrie, I didn't choose it. Um, I, I sort of, I sort of fell into it in a way, discovered it. I, I went to my boss first to see if we could, um, maybe try lending to low income people or even the lower middle class in Brazil, which was a country I'd fallen in love with. Um, he gave me a book called The Accidental, um, Anthropologist. And, uh, okay. so, that was the end of that conversation. Um, what what was that book about? Was that like it was essentially oh. about naivete and idealism? <laughs> okay, in other words, settle down. All right, we'll get this out of your system. Is that what he was saying to you? And so, yeah. Um, well, quite frankly, I didn't even read it. Um, <laughs> it was just you know conversation over. I felt mm. I felt. Um, not demeaned because he, I don't think he was being mean. I think he was trying to do me a favor. But yeah, um, like let, let, let me let me acquaint you with the real world where you're going to spend your life and just get rid of your idealistic dreams, and we'll get you a good job here. You you were actually successful in banking, were you not? Quite. I was I was tagged as you know the the, the high producer. Um, yes, yes, I had been fast tracked um, and had been offered this very big job by the the COO of the bank. Um, an amazing man named Tony Triciano, who absolutely did not understand when I told him I was leaving um, Chase at a time when there were so few women in bank banking, having been given the opportunity to be on a fast track, working directly with him. But I knew at that age that if I didn't go to Africa, um, which is how I saw this continent of 54 countries at the time, mm. I would never go. Or and how old were you roughly 25. around that time that you left banking? 25? 25. And wow. so um, it wasn't to impact investing. It was to microfinance. Um, I had read mm. about Dr. Yunus and the Grameen Bank, which at the time was only about nine years old as a fledgling field. Um, but it made a lot of sense to me that if the banking system was not prepared to restructure itself internally, then you had to go outside the system and create alternative systems, which has been another theme in my life. And um, and so I ended up working with a small group of Rwandan women and um, co-founding the first microfinance bank in Rwanda um, in 1986. So that was eight years prior to the genocide. Wow. Yeah, you had some success early on and also a couple of major setbacks. What um, what were some of the struggles in the early years of trying to figure out microfinance and helping people? You have some really interesting thoughts. Uh, why don't we start here? Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Say that and then I, I don't want to... Uh, I have stuff. so many failures. We could spend the, the next two hours on these um, <laughs> the string of failures. Um, so I first joined an organization. There were only three or four organizations in the world that did microfinance at the time. And I thought I had this extraordinary opportunity to quote unquote, be an ambassador to African women and help build microfinance organizations. Um, in West Africa, I had an office at the, um, at the African Development Bank in, in Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire. And I, um, I think I made a fundamental mistake in thinking I was going to save the world, uh, that I had all these tools and skills to offer and, mm. and that I really love people and they would love me back. And in fact, I discovered in a very painful way that most people don't want saving and they certainly didn't want saving by a young white American who didn't understand, um, the culture had a terrible command of the language and um, and a lot of enthusiasm that got me exactly nowhere. 
And so I, I had to learn humility very quickly. Um, and I also mm. had to learn that it wasn't only my lack of humility. I needed to find partners on the other side who actually wanted to work with me on solving problems and were serious about it. And, and I, then I, uh, so I left Cote d'Ivoire, I ended up in Kenya. There I, um, had a second major failure in that, um, I helped, uh, an existing microfinance bank essentially analyze their financial creditworthiness. I looked at every single loan. I spent 200 hours on a series of spreadsheets and essentially identified not only that the bank was fully insolvent, but that there was a lot of corruption inside it. I saw all that as bad news, good news, bad news, that we had a huge problem on our hand. Good news that now we understood the problem so we could solve the problem. Um, the executive director did not see it that way. And now in retrospect, of course she didn't. Her whole job would have been on the line. Um, and while I offered all of this to her in confidentiality with the promise that I would help her fix it, um, her next move was to take all of these um, spreadsheets and um, set them on fire and put them in a wastebasket. Uh, this was prior to the top, to the era of computers, so everything was hand yeah, done yeah. on those big ledger sheets. So destroy the evidence. Yeah, destroy yeah. the evidence. Two hundred hours gone, um, and so I just felt like everything I was touching was neither being appreciated nor landing on any level. And then two women walked into my office. Um, and asked me if I would go to Rwanda. Rwanda had just passed a policy to abolish Napoleonic Code, which was a code that saw women on the same level uh, as children and the mentally incapable. Um, women were not allowed to open a bank account without their husband's signature. Um, and now, March 19, or whatever year, whatever month in 1986, a new policy had been instituted. And they wanted to know whether I might help them explore the possibility of setting up some kind of financial institution for women in that country. And I think part of me knew, one, it was the first time African women had actually helped me, had actually invited me to solve a problem with them. Um, two, this was an area I actually knew something about. And three, I knew I had the enthusiasm having had these two massive failures um, and a lot more humility and some understanding that yes, I would help them. And secretly I knew I was not leaving until we had started that bank. It, it got it. pretty bleak for you. Yeah. Yeah. But it got pretty bleak for you. Like, was it, was it not true that there was rumor that some of the locals may have been trying to poison you to get you out? Well, that was when I was in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, I had to leave Cote d'Ivoire. Um, I got extraordinarily ill. Um, very isolated. I learned that in what might look from a, an outsider's view and frankly, an arrogant view, like a very small pond is nonetheless a pond. And the more you learn mm -hmm. about human nature, the more we understand that um, being a big fish in a small pond is still power. And I was unaware of that. Um, and so when I came splashing around with all my highfalutin ideas and access, it was so not appreciated. And I didn't know a soul in the country. Um, mm. That that was an extremely isolating and difficult experience. Rwanda was not like that. Um, I was always mm. in solidarity with my co-founders, who I adored. Um, and when the men would come up to me in restaurants, and there were only two restaurants in the whole city. Um, so in one of the two restaurants, <laughs> and, then, and they would say, you know, Jacqueline, you're ruining our women. I would just smile and say, it's not me. I'm just, I'm just pro providing the, 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 the back end support here. Um, uh, you know, these were the first three women parliamentarians in the country. They were three of my five co-founders. And, um, and that was sort of fun. Because the stakes were clear. Well, I thought the stakes were clear. Um, hmm. I had another whole set of setbacks um, that taught me a lot about life. Uh, probably the most important one 
and tragic one, um, being, um, connected to the woman I loved the most, uh, a nun actually bringing us back to this theme. That's so funny, Carrie, a nun named Felicula. Um, she was an extraordinary woman, one of the first three parliamentarians, first three women parliamentarians in the country. Um, big ideas. She was the most entrepreneurial of the three, um, parliamentarians and, um, more idealistic than she was pragmatic, but I could bring the pragmatism. She brought the idealism and we were a team. Um, hmm. until early on, um, right as we were registering Dutadembre, the name of our bank, which means to go forward with enthusiasm, um, Felicula helped push forward a new policy in the nation. This one, which would abolish, uh, the practice of bride price or a man paying a father for the hand of his daughter in marriage. I had nothing to do with it. In fact, I didn't even know they were doing it until the deed was done. And uh, a couple of days later, the women in the rural areas essentially revolted, saying, we used to be wor worth, quote unquote, worth three cows. Now we're nothing. And the elite wow. women so were disconnected from the speed with which their country women were ready to make change. Forget about their country mm -hmm. men. And, um, and a few days after that, Felicula was killed in a hit and run car crash. And there were many rumors oh. that it was a government hit job, whether it was or not, we'll never know. But that at age 26 was the first time I had to confront the price some people pay, um, in going up against the status quo. Um, wow. and, and how brave so many people actually are, even if you can't imagine the stakes with which they really are playing. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm so sorry. One of the things of, as I've, I've heard your story, as you told it here and in other places is why didn't you quit? Why didn't you just get back on a plane, go back to America and go, the guy who handed me that book was right. This is too complicated. This is too difficult. I don't understand. I'm not the right person. Because there's so many people listening who want to make a difference and we give up pretty quickly. Why did you not quit? Probably a mix of... Um, of resolution and also maybe resolution ego and a little hubris no hmm. faith because i think hubris and ego went together resolution in that i had come to help build a bank for women and i had not completed that job nor had i finished what i had come to learn ego in that i had told the number two guy at one of the biggest international banks in the world that I had to go to another continent to help bring a new credit system to low-income women. And I could not go back three times a failure. I could not go back until I'd done it. So that's the ego piece. And the third, um, actually, I would say is adventure. Hmm. It was hard and I cried on a lot of nights. And there were a lot of setbacks and I learned more than I could have imagined learning. And I learned about things I never wanted to learn about. On the other hand, every minute of every day was full of life, was full of beauty, was full of possibility. I, 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 I felt so alive, um, that I became addicted to that feeling of how alive we can be if we dare to commit to something bigger than ourselves. And that in that commitment, how free we can ultimately be too. It's just not easy. No, no, it's not easy. Well, I'm, I'm glad you stayed. I'm glad you didn't jump back on a plane. I'm glad you kept pushing because the rest of the story was still to come. So despite the, the, the at times tragic setbacks in Rwanda, you started to get some progress. You started to see that, okay, I was accepted by local people. You have a few principles that uh, the opposite of poverty is not money. Do you want to, do you want to talk about that? What is the opposite of poverty? The opposite of poverty is not income. It is dignity. It's choice. 
It's opportunity. It's knowing that you matter and that you have something to contribute. And I learned that in not only while I was in Rwanda, but I learned that even more so after Rwanda. Those women with whom I started that bank ended up playing every conceivable role of the genocide, including being perpetrators. I saw in that time of deep insecurity how easy it was for demagogic leaders to prey on people's insecurities and their fears, and rather than move them toward wholeness and solving their problems together, move them instead to blaming and fearing and ultimately killing one another. And that is when I realized that this is, this is not about money. This is about human worth. This is about seeing each other for our true humanity. And the, and the systems that I had by then at a, still at a very young age worked in too often failed in doing that. Markets too often overlook the poor or they exploit the poor. Mm. Government aid, well intended charity too often creates dependency. That is not dignity. <laughs> What we needed to do, and this is where Acumen came in, was to use the best of markets because they have such an important role to play for innovation, for believing in the future, for allocating resources, yet bridling them and ensuring that they can then be used in a way that includes low-income people. And that will require an element of philanthropy. That will require partnership with government. But the I need to make a plea for nuance because it is in that nuance that our dignity resides. So are we skipping too far ahead if we talk about Acumen now? And uh, that started, what, 2000, 2001, you started Acumen? Yeah, yeah. So you had 14, 15 years in microfinance. What, how did that continue to evolve? How did it evolve? So... in a, just a very short arc. So started in microfinance at, again, at this very early stage of microfinance where no one even knew whether it was ethical to charge interest or not. And then it went up to right. people were charging 90% per year interest, you know, the craziness of starting new sectors, excuse me, that had never existed before, um, as part of my own apprenticeship, if you will. Um, but then I, I went to business school. I um, met another mentor, a man named John Gardner, um, who was the only Republican on um, Lyndon Johnson's cabinet, uh, wow. worked with King, uh, Martin Luther King on civil rights, just an extraordinary man um, who also really had ma massive influence on me in terms of how to think about community and capitalism within it. And, um, and then I went to the Rockefeller Foundation and saw learn to think in, in big ways about systems change. And, and it wasn't really until 2000, 2001, as you said, that I thought, now I really understand these different systems of pure markets, pure philanthropy, pure government, and let's try something different. Let's revolutionize. How they can all somehow work together. We can work together on this. But we can't start with the instrument that we have. My charity my financial portfolio, my government program, we have to start with understanding who people are. And low-income people are rarely seen as full human beings, frankly. And so yeah. if you flip the model, you start by standing with the poor, you understand what their preferences are, what their needs are, the communities in which they operate, well, then you can bring the right kind of capital and the right bet on the right character, if you will, that will have the resilience and will have the, uh, the vision and will have the, uh, the business model, hopefully, to solve their problems, maybe you could solve these problems better. And so at the heart of Acumen was a symbol, single idea at the beginning, Carrie, this idea of patient capital, that yeah. we could raise philanthropy and we could invest for 10 to 15 years in an intrepid entrepreneur that was trying to solve a problem of poverty like healthcare or education or um, electricity or agriculture. 
um, for people who make two, three, four dollars a day in the developing world. Um, we would accompany those, um, entrepreneurs and we would use our privilege to get them access to markets, to get them access to other partners, corporations. We would measure the social impact, not just the financial returns. And we would, um, reinvest any money that came back to Acumen in new innovation for the poor. That was essentially the business model. It's obviously evolved in 20 years, but um, I'm happy to say that it works. And that was in many ways the pioneering first steps of um, impact investing. Is it a little bit like, um, and pardon the, the layperson's questions, but is it a little bit like um, venture capital for um, people who you think have entrepreneurship on the ground in the countries that need development. And, you know, this isn't to go public. It's not to go to market, um, you know, to make money. It's like you use the example of, of the solar company, right? The, um, the entrepreneurs who wanted to get rid of kerosene because it was so damaging to the environment, to people's lives, to people's homes, but you're investing in these micro enterprises that could become very big things. Is, is that similar to like, is that a, a decent Very explanation or is it missing the point? Except that many venture capitalists want in and out in a um, five to seven year period. And, and they want their money back, right? Yeah. And they yeah. want their money back sometimes 20 times over. Um, yes. And, and, and the more sophisticated we've become, the, the more creative we've been um, become as well in terms of how to use our capital. So the example that you gave um, which is off-grid solar electricity, um, is a story that starts in 2007 with two guys who have an idea. They want to eradicate this dirty energy source. Um, they don't know how to price it. They know their customers make two, three dollars a day. Uh, they discover very quickly that there's no infrastructure, that there's huge levels of bureaucracy and corruption in the areas in which people are living. Um, there's a lot of corruption. And um, and so we back them anyway, because we believe in the idea and we believe in them as entrepreneurs. I did not understand that we would be still backing them 14 years later. However, hmm. this is a company that has what I would call the moral imagination. They so cared who their customers were that they built products that were valued by them that they could access, that they could afford, and that, and they ultimately could trust. And that company today has brought more than a hundred million people, um, light and electricity and is profitable. That's, wow. that is what patient capital can do with the right entrepreneur and the right kind of accompaniment. What I'm seeing now in the United States that is thrilling is a new, breed of entrepreneurs that also move with moral imagination, that they see that we call it, um, moral imagination has the humility to see the world as it is and the audacity to imagine what it could be. So Sam Polk, Wall Street guy, wants to do something about um, food deserts in the United States, urban areas that have very uh, uh, low grade and very expensive food. Starts by starting a nonprofit, kind of a classic next move. Realizes that this will never grow. This will never really serve women's needs and not in any way that would provide them agency or dignity. And so he start, he sets up a company. It's called Every Table. It's located in Compton, Los Angeles. And, um, he decides that it's got to, again, who is my customer? So it's fast. It's nutritious. It's affordable. And within a couple of years, he has eight restaurants because people so value it and many jobs created in the communities. Lockdown happens and um, Sam sends a tweet out to all of his customers and says, if you need food, we'll get it to you. If you cannot afford it, we'll get it to you anyway. If you're willing to pay it forward, here's a link. And everyday people across Los Angeles start contributing charitable money so that people can get meals. Hundreds of thousands of meals get delivered. Then they partner with government. Today, it's quite a substantial company. Along the way, Sam realizes he's got to expand new franchises. But in the United States, 
black and brown people represent a very small percentage of people who have access to the kind of capital they need to start a franchise. So undaunted, Sam decides to create Every Table Academy. He will take his most hardworking, um, competent employees and take care of some of the, the, the needs that they couldn't have access to because of the, the structural problems inside our society. And so trains them for six months, accompanies them. You talk about the Jesuits, you know, walks with them mm. and um, provides them three years of salary and the kind and a loan so that they can build a franchise within the context of every table. And when they pay off their loan in a seven to 10 year period, they will own the franchise. Wow. That's the kind of creative thinking that combines the social agenda that we all have to have today with the best of capitalism in a fearless mm. way to solve our problems. And um, that's why I have the best job in the world. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting because you're right. So much is oppositional in our culture. It's capitalism versus, right, impact versus socialism. And what you've managed to do, and that's why I think it's so brilliant, is you've taken the best of several worlds and somehow fused them in a way that works together. The other thing, because we have a lot of impact organizations, church leaders, not-for-profit leaders, and also business leaders involved in their church listening, is you also make the argument that um, dignity is the opposite of poverty, but that empathy isn't enough. Can you can you explain what the limits of empathy are? Because there's a lot of virtue signaling, a lot of uh, you know, that kind of thing happening today. Why, why is empathy not enough? Empathy without action is, is too close to sympathy. Mm. I see you. I feel sorry for you. I don't do anything about it. And, <sighs> and therefore, what I ultimately am doing is reinforcing the status quo. I had a conversation mm. just yesterday with some young people who said, Jack, and I just can't focus. I can't work because of what's going on in Afghanistan. And I said, you know, to be honest with you, if you had family members who were personally impacted by that, I would understand. But given that we have access, we have knowledge, we have resources, if you care, do something. Reach out, use your voice, raise money. Otherwise, you're going to feel good about yourself, but not do anything for the world. And right now the world needs you. Hmm. How do you deal with compassion fatigue? That must be an issue. And I know for myself as a leader, particularly as social media has exploded, I don't know. And my wife and I were involved in several causes that are very close to us and we've taken some action. So it's not, it's not like we don't have a little bit of skin in the game. We do. But I look at the needs of the world and it can just be overwhelming sometimes. How do, how do you deal with that in your own life? Because there's what you have done, which is huge. And then there's everything else. Um, I, would, I would answer that two ways, um, Carrie. One is recognizing that effect, uh, effectiveness requires a strong heart and a strong head. And that if we are trying to be everything to everyone, too often we end up being very little to anyone. And so sometimes doing the work we came to do is part of responding to other crises. Um, one of Acumen's fellows in Pakistan um, was running a very innovative com company and I was a supporter and a, and a, and I was accompanying him when there was a terror attack that, um, uh, in, in the north of the country and 142 young people were killed. And he sent out a tweet to his supporters and said, I have to close down the business for a few weeks because I'm going up to help in Peshawar. And I wrote him right back and I said, call me cold hearted here, but you don't have anything to offer up there. Let the experts do it. That will make you feel good and, and not help the people who actually need it. Stay and do the work you came to do. 
raise your voice, but focus on being who you can be for the world. And, um, he said he ultimately put that on his, uh, printed out the email and put it out as well. Uh, but he was a little bit shocked at the beginning. And I, and I do think that is uh, a way that we need to stay focused on, on, on the work we came to do. On the other hand, um, I write about this in, in, in my book, um, in a chapter called Embrace the Beautiful Struggle. Because I think there are days when moral courage might be just the act of getting out of bed. <sighs> Facing some of the toughest things that you never wanted to face, never thought you would have to face. And not knowing if you had the energy to confront anybody. That the only way you can sustain this work is to find a practice that reminds you why you're here and that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. And for me personally, that practice has to do with reading poetry in the morning, nature going on long runs. Um, I love the Sufis, Mary Oliver. For other people, it might be prayer, meditation. It might be music or art. But it goes back to the beginning of our conversation. When I started out, no one told me how much beauty would be involved in doing the work of fighting poverty. But I've come mm. to see beauty as the urge to life. That um, mm. in every downtrodden community, every mean slum, um, you see people it dressing beautifully or putting geraniums in coffee cans or embellishing the pots that they use. And, and, and we do that too. And I think in this yeah. pandemic where we've had such a dark time, so have we seen these extraordinary acts of kindness and compassion and showing up and presence. And I put all that in the category of beauty. So we do have a lot of uh, people who like to have an impact listening, faith leaders, you know, not-for-profit leaders, et cetera. What, would, what are some things that people involved in that space could do to have a greater impact? Because I think we've looked at some of the problems. Empathy is not enough. It's not just money. You can't come in with the savior complex or the uh, you know, colonization idea that here, just adopt my culture and everything will be fine and you'll have a much better life. So we've gotten past some of that, but what else can we do if we want to make a better impact? And if that leads into 60 decibels, I think that would be great because I love your feedback system. Your, what is it? Lean, uh, lean, data. lean data, lean data, lean data. Yeah. So I'd love to touch on that. Um, Number one, which is connected to what you were talking about with the savior complex, but it is to truly know your customer um, and get a lot better at listening. So many of us think that we're good at listening um, and it's hard to listen. And by being good at listening, I would say entering a situation and listening from a place of inquiry, not certainty, not trying to convince or convert another person. That's hard to do, particularly with people um, who in many cases have never had questions asked of them. And I would say that sometimes in um, faith-based communities, um, people might underestimate the power and the influence that they actually hold over people who feel that they don't have power or influence and therefore will give you the answer they think you want to hear. And it is so seductive to think that that answer is the right answer. So learn to ask questions um, that allow people to find their own truth. And that might not happen in a single conversation. Um, a second thing I would say um, is to understand identity, not in a way that would divide us, but in a way that connects us. 
that each of us has multiple identities within us. And yet too often we, we reduce ourselves or reduce another person to a single identity. We miss huge opportunities to recognize the multiple identities in another person and building, finding that connection and building from there. Can you say more about that? What, what, what do you mean by that? Like multiple identities? It comes from the writer and scholar Amin Malouf, um, the Lebanese French writer, who wrote after 9-11 um, a book that I highly recommend called In the Name of Identity. And, um, and he essentially asked himself the question, how can we uh, massacre each other in the name of identity? And he said that, think about the multiple identities that you carry inside of you. You might be um, a male, white, Christian, a Southerner, um, son, musician, vegetarian. You know, I could go on and on and on with all of these identities mm-hmm. that lie. But if one piece of your identity is threatened and I suddenly say, I hate this or those people are that, it is highly likely that is that 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 sliver of your identity rises to the top of your hierarchy and that is all you become. And suddenly we are having mm. a conversation based on identity, not the wholeness of who we are and what we bring to each other. And we've all experienced it. If you think about um, when I'm sitting in a dinner party in Karachi, Pakistan, and the, suddenly the conversation turns to drone policy and I become the American expert on U.S. drone policy, uh, <laughs> I become more defensive. And yet when right. I'm going into customs and the U.S. customs officer questions me because I've just been to Pakistan and instead of seeing me as an ambassador, sees me as a potential threat, I feel like a global citizen. And so, right, both are true. I'm American. You're right. I'm a global citizen. I love the world. I'm proud of who I am, right? And so when a whole people, a wounded community, feels humiliated, really bad things can happen. And 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 look at 9-11. Um, and when we start to blame Muslims or refugees or name your group, that we would like to blame for our problems. We reduce an entire group to a single identity, which is so useless. And, 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 and too often it might create some of the actions that we actually feared in the first place. Hmm. Um, let's talk about 60. 60- Oh, identity, yeah. yeah. So I'll get to 60s. The third would be, which is harder edge, Carrie, then I'll get there. Because I think too often, both people in, to your point of um, faith-based leaders, nonprofit leaders, yeah. we have a fear or we have an ideology of markets. Um, it's really hard to talk about money. We think about business as dirty often, marketing as a terrible word, and yet um, you have to understand how the economy works, how money works, if you are going to make change, that there is power in learning how to move money, even if it's other people's money. There is a power in understanding how the economy works, and so... The issue, though, isn't to say, then I will take lock, stock, and barrel capitalism as my answer. No, it is learning it so well that you can learn how to control markets and not be controlled by them. Uh, Use the right kind of capital that you need in service of solving your problem, as with the um, solar lighting company, as with the restaurant company. we invested in a chicken company in Ethiopia where government had been the only, um, the only implementer, if you will, of the chicken industry. And there were very few chickens in the country. Uh-huh. One company, 10 years, and you have a company that serves 20 million smallholder farmers, has been credited with reducing child malnutrition, partners with government uh-huh. now, 
and has provided thousands of people with real career paths, completely out of poverty. <laughs> that came not from an ideological stance of markets or government, but one that recognized that we have these tools at our disposal if we can see investment as a means, not as an end. Now, if you're going to make that statement and you're going to say that my investment dollars may not have high financial returns, but will have social impact, then it is incumbent on you to be able to measure that impact. We could have a whole mm-hmm. philosophical conversation about those things that are impossible to measure. But even within that, there is a lot that is easy to measure. For Acumen, one of our principles beyond standing with the poor, using capital, not being used by it, um, is a, is a, is a third, which is to listen to voices unheard. And that connects to how we measure our impact. We developed a system called lean data using cell phone technology, whereby we can text five, 10,000 customers of a single company at any given time. We can ask a series of questions of these customers, again, who make two, three, four dollars a day, um, from which we can deduce how their lives have changed for the, for the better, for the worst. Um, whether they like the product, whether they would recommend the product. And so in the instance of solar lighting and electricity, not only can we now tell you about a specific company, um, how that company is doing in terms of carbon emissions, um, but also how many more hours of light do people have in a night? How do they use that light? Mm -hmm. Most people in East Africa, at least, use it to read the Quran or the Bible to have conversations. That is dignity. Flip on a light switch. We take it for granted. Have time to read at night. Um, We thought more light, kids would go to school and do better. Well, that turns out that they don't. But now we actually have have the data. We know. And so when you extrapolate that data across 10, 15 companies, and we're now the largest off-grid energy investor in the world for the poor, um, then you can start thinking about how you allocate your capital as an investor for impact, not just for financial returns. And, um, and it became so useful for Acumen that other entities like Omidyar Foundation and Kenny Arth, if you know the impact world, um, began to be a client of Acumen and, and, and we didn't want to become a consulting firm. And we also felt that we needed third party, um, a distance perspective, and so spun off Lean Data as a new for-profit company called 60 Decibels, which has just, uh, I'm on the board, it's its just done an incredible job at building a practice for measuring impact in a way that takes seriously the voices of the people who are being served by the investments that we make. What I love about that, Jacqueline, is how it probably challenges some of your assumptions because I think every creator has an idea of what you're going to do and the impact you're going to have. And then you find out what this didn't boost education for children or for women like I thought it would. Right. And that allows you to go back to the drawing board. 60 decibels. Can I take a shot at this? Because I don't know the answer to the question. It's probably wrong. Is that the uh, level at which human conversation happens? 60 decibels? Perfect. I got it right. All right. That's one of the stupid pieces of trivia I know that I've never had a chance to use in my life, but it's the sound measure of human conversation. Brilliant. 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 I was researching uh, leaf blowers. That's how I know that. So anyway, wanted to get one that was quieter. (laughs) So 60 decibels is human conversation. My new one uh, ekes out at 65 decibels. So there you go. Totally irrelevant. Um, You make the argument, uh, there's a few, we'll make this kind of lightning round because I want to honor your time, but this has been so helpful. And what I I think I so appreciate, you you must scramble so many categories because you agree with the capitalists on this, but not on this. And then you're with the humanitarian, so to speak, or progressives on this, but not necessarily on that. And then you're with the banking world on this, but not on that. And you're sort of lifting from different fields and putting them together, which I think is the the innovation. You make an argument that it's more difficult to give your money away effectively than it is to earn it in the first place. 
It's counterintuitive. Why? Why? In part because um, making money has a single bottom line. And at least until today, I think it's going to be more complex as we take stakeholders all the more seriously. But um, there are understood um, mechanisms for building a business that have a, a bottom line. And you know if you're succeeded and you know if you're not. The philanthropic sector is so subjective. There's so much brokenness to it. Um, too often philanthropists, they want impact. They want to do good, but they also want to feel good, look good, um, think they are good. And that's human. I'm not, I'm not casting aspersions here. Um, it makes it really hard to build something. And it also makes it really hard to know where to put your money. Um, and yet, if we started to think with the same rigor and discipline in the, in, with our, the money that we give away that we do in the financial sector by betting on an entrepreneur, investing in shares, if you will, giving operating money or just money to the organization so it can function rather than having a pet project that you will only give to and you only want to give to for a specific year, so much more could happen. And so hmm. I think giving a money away could be a lot easier if we shifted our mindset to betting on people, betting for multiple years, giving larger amounts of money and giving them for the overall organization so that it can do its work the work it came to do. And um, and that requires trust, that requires honesty, and that requires a different kind of conversation. And we don't often talk enough about the power dynamics that exist when one of us has the money and the other one wants the money. And that's mm -hmm. where finding ways to create more rigor and new language and new structures to help us take seriously what impact is and articulate what we intend to do and hold us, hold each other accountable to whether we did what we came to do and what we've learned from it could change the whole game. Well, you are making a huge impact with your life. You have a lot of young leaders listening right now who are maybe 20, 25, 30 going, I want to make that kind of impact. Do you want to leave them with a word today, Jacqueline? What would you say to the person, yeah, they give here and, you know, they they pray about this or they served on some kind of mission trip or whatever, but they really want to make a difference with their life or they want to start a company. They want to start something that will make a, a positive change in the world. What advice do you have for them? Two words. Just start. I think too many of us dream or pray or wait for purpose to come to us. And I do not believe that purpose comes to most of us. Mm. It won't, it won't hit you while you're sitting at the starting blocks. Purpose comes to those people who dare to, to try to take a step to let that step teach you, even when you fail, and I have failed as we have discussed, um, it teaches you where to go next. And if you have the courage to get up and keep moving, you will soon find that a path is opening for you so that over the long term, you can live your way into purpose. Um, I, I, especially in this moment of such extraordinary urgency, where there is an immediacy of need and where each and every one of us, whether we work in the corporate sector or we're an entrepreneur or we work in a nonprofit or a faith-based organization or in government, our problems will not be solved unless we reimagine and have the courage to rebuild all of our systems and to move away from that definition of success that certainly dominated my generation of money, power, and fame to 
build a world that puts our shared humanity, our dignity, and the sustainable stability of the earth at the center. That's what require, is required of all of us in small and in big ways. So just start, let the work teach you, and, um, and find common journeyers along the path. Mm. It's great advice. Well, your new book is called Manifesto for a Moral Revolution. I would encourage people to have a look at it. Also, um, I don't do this very often, but I'd like you to make an ask of my audience if there was a step they wanted to take. So I'll be honest with you. I was trying to figure out as I was getting ready for this interview, acumen, acumen, how have I heard about this? Like I know about this company more than I should. So the work seemed really novel to me. And then I realized, ah, Seth Godin. Seth talks about it a lot, does he not? And has the Acumen Academy. So is there anything in that field that you would encourage people to explore or have a look at? So this is going to sound self-promotional, um, Carrie, and I hope it's not seen that way, but um, I worked with Seth, actually. So let yeah. me just promote Seth's great work. Um, <laughs> after the it's book, not self-promotional, trust book, me. Said, you know, You're not even close to that. <laughs> You're, you got to turn this into a course, you know, a master course. And so we worked together, um, and I learned a lot from him on building a master course for the, called the path of moral leadership. Um, and for you who love the Jesuits, there's a lot of Jesuit trading in there. Um, huh. but, uh, it's essentially going through the chapters of the book, the 12 practices. Um, and you do it with people across the world. So you'll meet extraordinary individuals. Um, and, uh, and the teachers are not just me, but many of the characters in the book. Uh, so people who will surprise you with what they've been able to do with very little. And I think the one of the, the, the biggest piece, pieces of feedback we've gotten from it is that people do find that it allows them to take a step toward their own purpose. Uh, Acumen as a manifesto. And at the end of this course, Everyone writes their own, and um, and that has proven to be a very powerful exercise. So I would say go to acumenacademy.org, sign up for the Path of Moral Leadership. Um, it's free if you buy a book, or if you can't afford it, let us know, um, and we'll find a, a, a way to get you a scholarship. That is just wonderful, Jacqueline. You've been so generous with your time. Thank you so much for, um, yeah, giving our, our listeners a look into your world, which is really extraordinary. I'm very much looking forward to part two of the Tim Ferriss conversation, which I think you and Tim are working on right now and going to finish. I would also highly recommend the interview you did with Chris Anderson, who also is the person you happen to be married to. And you did many other great interviews, your books, um, Blue Sweater as well, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, Thank you for what you do. It's uh, been a joy to spend some time with you today. It's truly my honor, Carrie. You are extraordinary. And, um, and your voice in this moment is just so important as we try to expand the conversations um, outside of bubbles um, to realize that it's when we realize just how much we each have to bring to one another that we get to generate the seeds of our shared human dignity. And so I believe that that is your work and I thank you for it. Well, thank you. You've got me very intrigued and I will be a student to learn more. And it's a beautiful fusion of three worlds, which tend to be oppositional and we didn't even get to it, but we are at a critical moment in human history. I know you and Chris believe that Seth believes that. And uh, so do I. And I think if we work together by the grace of God, we'll be able to figure it out. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you know, our community, the Acumen community, includes some of the more traditional religious communities in the world, as well as non-believers, and, um, and the most progressive and the most traditional. And, and I think that even on a microcosmic way, part of our work which is a community of people who in too many ways have been raised to hate each other, 
is to find a way of building a sense of belonging based on shared values that can encompass this extraordinary, complicated, beautiful human diversity. (laughs) With you on that, 100%. Jacqueline, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.